Good morning. Well, it's Sunday morning again. These days and, and these weeks are definitely flying by. Um, before we begin this study this morning, just want to share some good news with you. We've been praying for a, a very, very young man by the name of Owen, who was born prematurely. And ever since his birth, he's, he has been literally fighting for his life. And um, I don't think there's a week really that's gone by where that poor lad hasn't had some kind of fight on his hands. And it seems that at last he is beginning to stabilise, he's beginning to grow in strength. And we just thank the Lord. And I'm sure that Alan and Karen in particular, uh, you know, are, are grateful for people's prayers in this situation. And it's just time to thank the Lord and to thank those that have been praying. Also this, I think it was Thursday. On Thursday, I was mowing the, the lawn on the front and um, Mandy came out and said that Mr. Smart is on the phone. Now, Mr. Smart is my surgeon. And the last thing he said to me in hospital was, uh, if you hear from me, it's because you're going to need treatment. He, he actually said, I hope, you know, never to, uh, never to hear from me again, that we go on from here. So when she said that, I must admit, my heart kind of uh, did a couple of somersaults. Still had a, a, t a real piece, but you know what it's like. My heart had a few somersaults. They'd taken out a growth in my bowel, which was uh, over three inches long by two inches wide, massive growth. Um, and, and that's what I've been recovering from. That's why I've been self-isolating for, for this time to get my strength back, etc. Anyway, um, uh, Mr. Smart basically said to me, I'm, I'm letting you know that it is benign, that, uh, that they didn't find anything. He said, we took a large margin, which means that obviously they took more out than, than that. They took a, a, a large margin around it. And he says, uh, I, I, so I, I asked him, you know, does, is that, I know this sounds daft, but I asked him, is that good news? Um, to confirm it and, and he said oh yeah absolutely that's great news and there was no cancer and I, I, I let out a huge hallelujah um, and then after I got off the phone I went in the house and I let out an even bigger one <laughs> um, Mr Smart is a surgeon he's an amazing man and I told him that, I told him that, and I told him that we were praying for him. And he, he said, well, I'll take all the help that I can get at this moment in time. But I want to thank everybody this morning. First of all, I want to thank the Lord uh, for his mercies. Wonderful, merciful God we serve. There is no reason why I've come out of this uh, the last four months the way I have, um, it's not by my righteousness. I don't even believe it's by my level of faith. Um, God is so good. God is so good. I want to thank everybody that's prayed for me um, since November now. Um, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for being there and praying and there are times when you're going through something like this where you are completely relying on other people's prayers and it's quite surreal. It's surreal because I was told very clearly. I was told by a doctor friend of mine, this is gonna be bad. I was told by another nurse, top nurse, um, this is not good news, this is gonna be bad. We have a, 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 an ex-nurse in our church who, um, she phoned up actually, I think it was the day that I'd been told the news and um, 
and she paused when I told her the news and then she said, do you know, in the 50 years that I w was a professional nurse, she said, I've never seen a growth in that part of the bowel that wasn't cancer. So, all I can say is, um, I'm, I'm, am I'm amazed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. So that's it. Now I want to um, continue to look at the book of Revelation, particularly the study of the seven churches. God bless you, folks. First, I only have one cup of coffee a day. But boy, does that taste nice. So let's get into this fantastic study. And just before we go any further, although Christians and denominations will say that the Bible is all important, any denomination worth its salt will say that, very often within certain persuasions and denominations, they, ha they gravitate towards a certain book. There's people I know that gravitate towards Romans and, and it's as though Romans is the most important book in the Bible. Some of them will even go so far as to say that Romans is the most important book in the Bible. Others would say that it's the Gospels, the four Gospels. Others would say, well, no, it's really the, the whole batch of Paul's letters and, you know, the uh, various um, people will have that thing that they say is more important. You get the red letter brigade that say, well, it's only the red letters in the Bible that they're the most important. But what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus said that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus didn't actually uh, elevate one part of the scripture above the other when he was tackling Satan. He said man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. From Genesis right the way through to the book of Revelation and everything in between, everything in between, he says you can't live by bread alone, but by every word. One thing that we can say about the book of Revelation is that it encompasses that every word. The second thing that we can say about the book of Revelation is it's most certainly the final words to the church. It's right at the end, the words of Jesus, the letters, the seven uh, letters to the seven churches are the final words. Whether you can argue that they're the most important or not is really irrelevant when Jesus said every word in scripture is what you live by. Why do we even argue about silly things like that? The fact is, these are the final letters to the churches um, in the world, in Christendom. And from that perspective, they should be something that we look at and we study. And that's what we're going to be doing during this pandemic we're going to be looking and studying the seven churches. Father, we come before your throne this morning and we thank you, Lord, that from the very beginning, you, when you commanded Moses, you commanded him to make a mercy seat. And we thank you, Lord, that as we approach you, we find, Lord, that there is grace and there's mercy for every person that comes to you. And you said in your word, those that come to me, I will by no means cast out. We come to a merciful God. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done in our lives and for the myriads of things, Lord, that we know nothing about that you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of how much you love your people. And help us, my God, to love you in return in a way that's honourable to you. That, Lord, this relationship between us and you would truly be a relationship primarily based on love. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read this letter, the first letter to the Church of Ephesus. Let's, let's read it together. 
to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labour, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered, and have had patience, and have laboured for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. This you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amazing words. Amazing how Jesus, the first promise that he gives to the churches is, is something that we see at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis. A promise to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, what we're going to do first, we're going to look at the background to this letter. Then we're going to look at this letter. And then we're going to look at a study which goes beyond this letter. We're going to look at how this, these letters correspond to seven separate church ages. But we'll leave that at the end. Let's have a look, first of all, at some background to how this church came about, to who planted this church, Let's have a look at its roots, its conception, and let's understand the kind of church that this church was. So in Acts chapter 16, we read about Paul, and of course Paul and Barnabas, um, they, um, they had a bit of an argument. And um, concerning John Mark, and it was such a strong argument that they, they actually went the separate ways. Ultimately, Paul went on his second missionary journey with Silas and Barnabas went his own way. And they began to go off on this missionary journey. I'm just going to pick it up in verse Acts 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Why start there? Well, because it would seem that the Apostle Paul wanted to go to this area where Ephesus was, and Ephesus was clearly the the core the capital the 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 most important of the of the seven churches Ephesus was the big one from a commercial point of view most certainly and he he wanted to go there a few years earlier but the holy spirit actually forbid him from doing that so things in our lives that we 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 feel like the lord is wanting us to do but he actually stops us from doing it not because he's saying no you'll never do it but sometimes it's not yet and in this particular uh, point in Paul's life it wasn't no it was not yet so when we get to Acts chapter 19 Paul has finally gotten to this amazing place and he always begins by reaching out to his own people. It says in Romans chapter 1 that he's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. So he always began with the Jewish people. When he went to plant a church, he began with the Jewish people. But the usual thing happened. They didn't want to know. And so Paul 
very quickly came away from the Jews in this area and turned towards the Gentiles. And he began to reason. The word is reason. Let me read to you. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. He went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Wonderful. This is such a blessing to me because I do believe that the church is going to go back to this way of evangelising. You know, we've had this whole era of the Billy Grahams and things like that, and evangelism isn't really as popular as it used to be, which is a terrible shame. However, anybody can can sit down and reason with somebody. Anybody can do what Paul did. And he basically gently debated with people. And I think it's a very powerful form of evangelism. We've got a young man in our church, Richard. He's been saved a couple of years. He's really grown on the scriptures and really got stuck into the word of God and he's a very brave uh, man. He goes in the streets of Stoke-on-Trent with a massive camera that looks like a TV camera and he asks people if he can um, uh, uh, do, do an interview with them. And because they see this great big TV camera, they think it's important. So he does this interview with them. What they don't realise is it's been recorded off the little iPhone on the top of it, not the camera. Anyway, he, he, does a, he does a fantastic job and he reasons with people in Stoke-on-Trent and there really is some genuine fruit coming from this. We've got to get back to this and you know anybody can do it. It doesn't matter how clever you are, how old you are, how young you are, we can all find somebody and just reason with them. And that's what Paul did. It says in verse 10, And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. What a compliment this is, you know, to the work that went on there. It says that he continued for two years, reasoning, reasoning, so that all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, uh, both Jews and Greeks. Amazing. But it doesn't finish there, it goes on. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out from them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so and the evil spirit answered and said Jesus I know Paul I know but who are you then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded wow this became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burnt them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Millions and millions of pounds worth today. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The book of Acts continues on to talk about how not only were there incredible signs and wonders documented, not only were people released from terrible demonic activity in their lives, not only did people stream to Paul and throw away their magical books worth a fortune, but the sales of the idols in Ephesus, the sales of the idols of Diana, Artemis, this this temple, the seventh wonder of the world at the time, the sales plummeted. There was an economic collapse in Ephesus because the word of God was so strong, so powerful. So many people were streaming to hear 
um, the gospel at this time that the, a riot broke out in Ephesus. They were pulling Paul one way, pulling him the other way. You know, he, Paul literally turned this place upside down for the gospel. Sometimes we wonder, don't we? Uh, why don't we see miracles like we used to see miracles? And people, there are all these wonderful kind of, you know, reasons why and seven steps to this and do this and do that and do the other. Why, 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 why? Clearly at this time, in terms of signs and wonders and miracles, there was a spike on the graph. It was a huge spike. I mean, the signs and wonders and miracles were off the chart when Paul went into this terribly dangerous region of which Jesus would later say was part of the seat of Satan on earth. And he went into this region where there was these principalities and, pa and powers which were, which were bound up into, in this temple to Diana. He went into this region that nobody had been in before and, and, and preached the fullness of the gospel, including the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there was a spike on the graph of signs and wonders and miracles. And people asked, why do we not see these things today? Very, the, the, the answer is, is, is normally... Well, it's because we haven't got the faith. We haven't got the faith. And normally that's it. That's normally that's the thing that people say. And that's definitely part of the answer. Definitely part of the answer. But it's not the full answer. You see, James said that faith without works is dead. There's lots of people that claim to have faith. Quite frankly, some of them make me sick. They, they make me sick. They make me angry, some of them. You know, they go on and on and on about faith. This kind of faith, that kind of faith, the other kind of faith. They want to lecture about faith, tell people about faith, blah de blah about faith. Faith without works is dead. It means nothing. You can have all the faith in the world. If you're not putting your faith into action, it's dead. What Paul did is he put the faith that he had into action. He took this faith into an area that had never had the gospel, never been exposed to the light of the gospel, into unknown territory. He pushed the boundaries of the kingdom of God. He went into darkness and he brought the light. He took his faith, he coupled it with his works and there was a spike on the graph like that. Faith isn't about how many books you can write about faith. Faith isn't about how many sermons you can preach about faith. Faith isn't about how many scriptures that you can quote about faith. Faith without works is dead. And the reason why we don't see the spike on the graph with signs and wonders and miracles is because we've stopped pushing the gospel forward. Why do we see these spikes in Iran? The fastest growing church on earth is Iran right now. Why are they seeing signs and wonders and miracles? Because the gospel is being pushed into an unknown territory. And it's not just going with faith, it's works, they're doing it. The second fastest growing church in the world is Afghanistan. Same thing again. They're doing it, they're taking the gospel. They, they are... They are um, evangelizing an area that's never been evangelized before. There aren't churches on every street corner in Iran or in Afghanistan. There are not. It is Islamic to the core. You can die for it. And what happens? God accompanies it with signs and wonders and miracles. Same thing in China and in Indonesia, anywhere where you see a resistance towards the gospel, anywhere where you see terrible darkness, anywhere where you see people going in faith and taking their works and bang, there's a spike on the graph. It's not just about faith. We can sit in circles and talk about faith all day long. It's when you take the faith that you have and do something with it. That's what Paul did. That's why there was a spike on the graph. This was an incredible work. The church of Ephesus had the best beginning you could ever wish for. Three years with the Apostle Paul. Three years with this brilliant teacher trained under Gamaliel. 
that understood how to rightly handle the word of truth. They had Jewish roots teaching from the very outset. This was a special church. Paul st stayed there longer than he stayed anywhere else. It was his finest work. Along came Timothy after him. John even had time there. Mary lived there for a while. This was a, the, the foundation that had put in place for this church were, were amazing. As good as you could get. The best beginning you could wish for, both doctrinally and also the power of God. They were both there in abundance. So what happened? How on earth did this church go from the, this incredible beginning to what we see? Well, let's have a look a little bit further. Let's look at the, what the Apostle Paul writes to this church when he writes to them, having left them. He writes to them with such love. And this is what he says. Ephesians um, chapter 1. I'll start from verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to, look, listen to this language. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I wonder whether this is coming against the whole spirit of Diana that was in this place, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice that, in love, in love. Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the play, praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth in him. And on he goes. Let's go to verse 15. Therefore I also, after I, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. This is the third time that Paul has talked about this remarkable love that was very evident in the church at its beginnings. He said, he does not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, of revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, by which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name, that is named not only in this age, but also in which is to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head above all things to the church, who is the body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. What a letter. What a letter. So we see the beginnings in Acts 19. We see the spike on the graph. We see that faith is combined with works. We see an explosion of power. Not just doctrine, but power. Bang! You've got the Word and the Spirit combined. and Bang! Then you've got Paul's letter to them. Which is just so profound. It's such an incredible star. Fill them, Lord, with all wonder, wonder, uh, wisdom and revelation. And Thank you for their love, Lord. Thank you for their love towards you. Thank you for their love towards one another. Oh, hallelujah. And they are seated with you in heavenly places, Lord. And I'm going to tell them. I'm going to remind them. Amazing. Amazing. Now, it's 
Interesting to note that before Paul left them after his three years with them, he warned them. Let me just read this to you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will raise, rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now this is important. Paul tells us here that before he left this church, he warned them that wolves would come. This was a significant work, probably the most significant work of all of Paul's church plants. It was obvious that wolves were going to come. It was obvious that Satan was going to have a go in some way. Paul warns them, watch, keep watch, watch out for wolves, they're going to come. He says, I've been with you three years teaching this stuff, watch out. Now clearly, this is what the church did. Now this is important. It may be obvious to some people, but it won't be obvious to everybody. This church was planted around about AD 40, something like that. Maybe a bit past that. Yeah, it was definitely past that. There was a rough, there was roughly 40 to 50 years between the church of Ephesus being planted and the letter from Jesus in the book of Revelation. 40 to 50 years had gone by. We've just read how the church began. We've read about the signs and the wonders and the miracles. We've read about Paul's letter that was given to this church, which was one of the most wonderful letters written full of revelation. And we've, we've now read that Paul warned them that wolves would come in. So how did the church fare over the next 50 years? Let's turn, finally, to the book of Revelation. Let's look at this church now, 50 years on, 60 years on, and let's see what changed. I'm going to read the last verse of Revelation chapter 1 to begin with. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. That's important. We'll come back to that. Then we begin. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Okay. Now we've seen what Paul did. Ephesus was the greatest seaport in Asia. It had a population of about 250,000. It was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. Ephesus was on the highway to Rome. That is, the, the many roads came to Ephesus and it was part of the highway of Rome. So commercially and economically, Ephesus was booming and incredibly prosperous. It had a theatre that had 25,000 seats. It had the Temple of Diana, which was one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. I'm not going to go on and on and describe that thing. There's many descriptions on it. It was incomprehensibly wonderful and, and elaborate and very, very, very dripping with gold and marble and you name it. It was a very, very dark place of worship. Perhaps one of the reasons why Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 6 in the book of Ephesians. There was a huge image of Domitian, 
four times the normal size, um, depicting him as Zeus, the god of gods. And of course, this would be a place where the people would be rounded up once a year on what they called the Day of the Lord. And they would have to pinch some incense and they would have to say that Caesar is Lord. And if they didn't, they would be dealt with. It was known as the highway of the martyrs so that the, all the martyrs, all the Christians that had kept the testimony of Jesus and the word of God would be taken through Ephesus, shipped across to Rome and would uh, meet their earthly end in the Colosseum. It's to this place that these people grew up. They grew up here. They had had this incredible beginning, but they were up against it. It was a dark place, satanically dark. And the first thing that Jesus wants this church to know in Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 is that he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now then, we've just read in the last verse of chapter 1 that the lampstands are the seven churches. So what's Jesus telling this church? He wants them to know that he walks in the midst of all the seven churches. Why does he tell this church that? Because this is the mother church. This was the first church. This church was planted and the other churches were planted out from this. So this church didn't just concern itself with this church. It would have had a burden for the other churches too. And Jesus wants to tell them, I walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I walk in the midst of the churches. And there's something that we need to understand here. You know, we're in the middle of this pandemic. Yes, we're self-isolating. This time will come to an end eventually. Churches will meet together again. At some point it's going to happen. I think that there will be people that will take liberties that will not meet after this. There will be, people will. They'll use it as an excuse. They'll come out with a multitude of reasons why you don't really need to meet and that the church is not the building and all the usual things that people come out with that just don't want to meet together with other Christians. And there'll be a whole list of reasons and there will be those that will not come back to church in all denominations everywhere. It will happen. The sheep have been scattered and there will be those that will remain scattered. However, you need to understand there is a principle in the scriptures about church. God inhabits the praises of his people. We're told in Hebrews not to neglect the gathering together. In fact, as we see the day approaching, we should gather together even more so. Here, we're told that Jesus walks in the midst of the lampstands. In Acts chapter 2, they were all together in one accord. Jesus wants his people to be together. When people tell you that anything otherwise, watch out. Jesus wants his people to be together. One of the major points of this, this letter is that very thing. I'll come to it in a bit. He walks in the midst of the lampstands. Well, you know, well, I've chosen to work on a Sunday. I've chosen to work on a Sunday. Every Sunday I work and, you know, um, I know plenty of people that have chosen to work on a Sunday. When I was a young Christian, they told me I got to work on a Sunday. So I said to them, well, it's the Lord's Day. I would prefer to work on a Saturday and take somebody's shift on a Saturday and they can do my Sunday. Well, everybody jumped at it because you only got time and a half on a Saturday and it was a much harder day than a Sunday. So I just used to ask people, will you do my Sunday if I do your Saturday? Well, they jumped at it because they got double time on a Sunday and I only got time and a half on a Saturday. So I'm, I made a deal with my work colleagues and I did their Saturday. They did my Sunday. I got to go and be with the people of God. And you know something, friends? God blesses and honours people when he sees that they really want to be with the people of God. I believe that. I believe that. We'll come to that more at the end. He walks in the midst of the lampstands. He's in the midst of the churches. That's where Jesus is. It tells us in John 17, he doesn't even pray for the world. He's praying for those that the Father has given him out of the world. He walks in the midst of the lampstands. 
you get people today saying you don't have to um, go to church to be a Christian. And they give a whole load of reasons that seem to, seem to be, you know, justifiable reasons. But very often I find that the people that say this are quirky people that fall out with people too easily and find fault with people too easily. We're to put up with one another in love and to be together. Listen, Jesus walks in the midst of the lampstands. Hallelujah. You're not going to find the perfect church. I'm speaking to you. You're not going to find the perfect church. And listen, if you join that church, it won't be perfect any longer, that's for sure. Jesus walks in the midst of the lampstands. And he says to them in verse 2, I know your works. Jesus knows everything. We see this in the Gospels, don't we? There's nothing he doesn't know. Peter says, I'll never deny you. Jesus knows everything. Nathaniel comes to him, he says, I saw you from the, from the fig tree. He says to Peter, you, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. There's nothing he doesn't know. He knows us. He knew us before the foundations of the earth. I know, he says, your works. I know your works. And he begins by commending them for what are genuinely good, solid, dependable works. He says, I know your works, your labour, your labour. This was a hard-working church. This was a church that didn't just stand around talking about it. This was a hard-working church. He says, I know your labour and I know your patience. I know you've had to have patience. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. Jesus is commending this church for not bearing those who are evil. Now, in Galatians chapter 6, he talks about bearing, bearing up with one another. And in that sense, we are too. Because we can all be really stupid, let's be honest. Everybody can have a wobble. Everybody can have a moment in their work where they just go south for a bit. And, and you know, we, we have to bear with one another. We all have these moments in a Christian walk. We're to bear with one another. But Jesus says, I, 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 he commends them for not bearing up with those who are evil. There's a difference. There is a difference. And this church could spot somebody that was morally rotten. And they didn't give them the time of day. And, it, and, it's, and it's absolutely right. It's absolutely right how we should be. We should be discerning. We should be able to spot somebody and watch them carefully and see their fruit. Matthew chapter 7, it begins, verse 1 begins and says, judge not lest you be judged. And people will often quote this. 15 verses later, in exactly the same chapter, only 15 verses later, Jesus says to them to watch out for wolves. Watch out for them. They'll come to you as sheep in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And what does he say? You will know them by their fruit. So at the start of the chapter, he says, do not judge. 15 verses later, he says to them, watch out for wolves. So what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. We are not to go around condemning people, judging people, condemning people. That's not our job. We're not the judge. There's one judge. But at the same time, we are to test and we are to have discernment and that's what's been spoken about here he says I know your works your labor your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil he says I don't want you to bear them I don't want you to bear them and that you have tested that means experimentally they've watched they have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. I always find this. General rule of thumb, and this is only general, but a general rule of thumb is, when you meet somebody for the first time, if the first thing they want to tell you is what they are, their title, it's normally a, a, a fairly good indicator that they're gonna be a nightmare. 
Because they, all they want to do is tell you who they are and, and, and how highly they're ranked. And when you see people come into the church and they shake your hand and the first thing they tell you is, oh yes, I'm an apostle, or I'm a bishop, or I'm a prophet, or I'm this, or I'm that, I'm that. it's normally, I would say 99% of the time, it's an indication that that person is going to be a nightmare. Anybody that's truly humble doesn't have to tell people in their first breath what their title is in the church. And I think there are many, uh, there will be many people that have come to this church. It was a significant church, right? Big church, significant church, a very fruitful church. There were many people that would have come to this church and kind of tried to worm their way into it, into some kind of a position. And Jesus says, you've tested them experimentally. You've watched them and you've, you've done what Jesus told you to do in Matthew chapter 7. You've seen their fruit and their fruit is not good fruit. And you have made sure that they cannot get into a place of influence in the church. And that's what we do as leaders. That's what we do as shepherds. We make sure that people that we have a big question mark over do not get into an area of influence in the church. And if necessary... We send them out. Most of the time, you don't have to do that. Most of the time, they get the sense, uh, uh, enough sense to know that they're not actually welcome. Very often, even the, 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 the church itself can, the body itself can reject that virus, that germ out. But this church was good at that. And Jesus commended them for that. You know, these churches that anything goes, come in. You know, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe, what persuasion, just come in. We just want the church to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, um, back in the day, some years ago, there was a church in Stoke-on-Trent. They had the audacity when Stoke Football Club were playing. They had a banner um, put out saying, the biggest church in Stoke-on-Trent. Come to our church, it's the biggest church in Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Like, that's the only thing that matters, right? To be the biggest church. Oh, doesn't matter who you are, come on in, come on in. Just keep clocking up those numbers and let's, let's just proclaim ourselves to be the biggest. This church wasn't like that. <laughs> this church was all about making sure that those that are coming in were not going to affect the body in a negative way. And Jesus commended them for that. He really did commend them for that. And when he comes to bring the critique to this church, that doesn't negate the fact that they were hardworking, that they had patience and that they wouldn't bear those that were evil and that they tested those that said they were apostles. In fact, it doesn't negate any of that, by the way. You've got to understand that. That's important. It doesn't negate any of that. He says in verse 3 that you have persevered and you have had you've had patience and you have labored for my namesake and you've not become weary. It's a great con, uh, um, it's very commendable. I was going to say condemnation. <laughs> it's very commendable. They've had 40 years of the best teaching that you could have had, the Apostle Paul, trained by Gamaliel. Real good Jewish roots teaching. Timothy there, John, even Mary resided there. This, was, this, this place had it. This was the centre. This was the mother church of the other churches. There was all this Greek influence beginning to come into the churches and kind of, you know, Gnosticism and things infiltrating in, but not, not here. Not here because they got their doctrine right. Their, their, their foundations were, were solid. They had, they had persevered in this area. They'd had patience in this area. They laboured in this area. And, they, and they'd done it for the Lord's namesake and they had not become weary. Was it say at the end of the resurrection chapter, Corinthians 15, you know, do not become weary in your labour of the Lord because it's not in vain. You don't labour in vain on, you know, don't become weary. Then he gets to the condemnation. 
So it's commendation, commanding them to condemnation. Or if they were to stay in this, there would, there would come something of the judgment of God even on this church. Now think about it, friends. If the judgment of God would come on a church like this with the beginnings that this church had, we need to understand, don't we? So let's get to it then. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Okay. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Three times Jesus talks about their love. Either love for God, their love in general, and Ephesians 1 verse 15, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints. There's this thing at the moment that's been doing the rounds now for quite some time. As Christians about now, they don't go to church anymore. And they always refer to God as their God. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I have my God, right? My God. And I don't, you know, I, I do this, I do that. I've got my God. And I don't need to go to church. And I don't need this thing. I don't need that thing. I've got my God. When I love God, you can't question my love for God. And you can't, can you? That's the thing, you can't, you can't, you can't. You know, there's, there's, there's no way of really questioning somebody's love for God apart from their fruits. And so, in the Bible, all of the commandments in the Bible whittle down to two. All of them whittle down to two. Jesus told us this, by the way. He says the first, first commandment is vertical. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love, just love God with everything that you have. That's the first commandment and it's vertical. The second commandment Jesus said is like it. Love one another. Love one another. So you've got these people saying, I just got my God and I love my God. And there's no way of questioning that. Apart from, if you really love God, it becomes evident in your love for your brothers and sisters. And the fact that you want to be a part of the family of which God is the father of. Oh, I love God. God's my father. I can't stand any of his kids. Even though father tells me I need to love them. Even though father tells me I need to be with them. All together in one accord. Not neglecting the fellowship of the saints together. Even though the father walks in the midst of the lampstands, you know, I love God and I have God and I don't need my brothers and sisters. It's rubbish. 20 years ago, we would call this being backslidden. You call somebody backslidden these days, you'll never see them again. They're gone. <laughs> if we love the father, we're going to love his children. If we love the head, we're going to love the body. We don't serve a decapitated God that has no body. We serve a God that has a body. And the church is the body. And we are to be connected to the body. I've mentioned this before many a time. The, the bones scattered in the, in, the, in the valley in Ezekiel, they're scattered, they're totally dis disassociated and disconnected from one another. That's not church. And off the back of this pandemic, we've got to learn something, friends. We have to learn that it's not just about a vertical love for God. It is as much about a horizontal love for one another as it has ever been about a vertical love for God. And until we get back to that, until we get back to our first love, which is both vertical and horizontal, we will never see anything of a move of the Holy Spirit. Never. Some of the so-called moves of the Spirit that we've seen recently have been spiritual abuse. It's been all about God. My God has told me to tell you this. I know this is going to wreck your life, but my God has told me to tell you this. And, you know, 
No. Love is not just vertical. You're kidding yourself if you think that you can walk this walk and just love God and have nothing to do with the people of God. It's not just vertical. It's horizontal. We're to be in fellowship with one another. And the problem with this church is that at, at its beginning, it was taught so well. What did Paul say to them? I want you to know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God. That was what he wanted from this church. They loved God. They loved one another. It's there in the scriptures. They loved one another. 50 years later, they probably still thought that they had a great love for God. But the fact that they had such little love for one another proved that their love for God was dwindling. They had left their first love. Many Christians are praying that during this time of isolation, we will grow in love for one another and that when we come back together, instead of rejecting people so quickly over silly little things, when all of us are weird, actually, we're all odd bods, we're all peculiar in some way or another, we all have some very odd ways about us, that we, we yes, yes, we don't bear those who are evil. Absolutely, totally. Yes, we test those who say are apostles and are not. Absolutely. But in the midst of doing that, we must love one another as we say we love God. And that's the whole point of what Paul is saying here. And then he goes on, not Paul, Jesus. Then he goes on and he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen. This is a massive fall, a massive fall. Because love is the greatest manifestation of, of anything. Three things abound, faith, hope, and love. I know people that go on and on and on about faith. How we must have faith. How faith is so important. That we must have faith for, for, for healings. As though healings are the be all and end all of the life here. As though that's the only thing that matters, healings. Faith, 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 faith. The greatest manifestation of faith is love. Three things abide, faith, hope and love. You can have faith that will remove mountains, but if you've not got love, you've got nothing. And if you can't fellowship with the people of God, you haven't got love. You, you haven't got it. And we need to take a look at ourselves in the light of this scripture here. Oh, I can't go to church because they haven't got the faith levels that I've got. Really? Really? You honestly think your faith level is that high? If your faith level was that high, you would love people because the greatest manifestation of faith is love. This is the word of the Lord to the root church, to the Hebrews, the, the, the Jewish root church, the church with the best start, with the best foundations. He says this, I know you've got everything else in place, but in so doing, you've disassociated yourself now and you've got no love. You've left your first love. There's a reason why Jesus was fixed upon the cross in the vertical and horizontal position. He was pinned in that position for six hours. Why? Because we, that is mankind, we have altogether failed God vertically and horizontally. We have failed to love God and we failed to love one another. And he sent his son to suffer vicariously in our place as our substitute. His son was pinned upon an altar in a vertical and horizontal position. His son succeeded to love the father with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. He succeeded to love his brothers and sisters as much as he loved his father. He loved perfectly. And therefore he was pinned in that position because he was the sinless one. Satan had nothing on him. Therefore the sins of every one of us was placed upon him. And he died to those sins. And the wages of sin is death. So when the sin of 
the world was placed upon the lamb, the victim, the Lord Jesus, suddenly he became sin. So that through him, we might have the righteousness of Christ. A divine transaction happened upon the cross. He became sin and he gave us his righteousness. However, even though he became sin, he never sinned. So therefore, even though death, even though he had to die, his body had to die, he would never have to experience the ultimate reality of death, which is separation from God. Yes, he had to die because the sins of the world was placed in his body, but there was nothing stopping him from being raised from the dead because no sin was in him. And so he rose from the dead. If anybody else tried to be a substitute for mankind, they could have been pinned upon a cross vertically and horizontally. But I'll tell you this, when it came to resurrection, they would never have been resurrected, ever been resurrected. Even if it was the Apostle Paul, even if Paul somehow miraculously could choose to die for the sins of the Jewish people, Paul could not have been raised from the dead because only the sinless one, only the one that had never sinned, could be raised from death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died bodily to death. But nothing could stop that man, the Prince of Life, being resurrected because he is the only sinless one that has ever lived. What do I mean by sinless one? He loved his Father perfectly and he loved the people of God perfectly. From the vilest of sinner to the saintliest of saint, he loved us perfectly. The price has been paid. The greatest demonstration of love has been done. The cross is the symbol of love. It always has been, always will be, vertical and horizontal. And it's that which Jesus is calling the mother church back to. He's not saying to them to throw out doctrine. This is where we go wrong. He's not saying that. He's saying you stick to the word of God, stick to your principles. You were right to not bear with people that are evil. You're right not to tolerate those that say they're apostles when they're actually liars. You're right in doing that. But get back to your first love, loving Father and loving one another. Get back to love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Now this is crucial, this is crucial. Oh, hey, we, are, we are all good at reminiscing. And you know what? I never thought I would be. Because, uh, you know, you always consider yourself to be young somehow, don't you? And I, I never thought that I would be a reminiscer. I find myself now, sometimes at church, as I'm preaching, reminiscing. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this. Even I'm doing it now. Reminiscing, talking about the good old days. You know? And, and we, we love to do it. We love to reminisce when we had this love, this passion, this love for God, this love for one another. We sit around in circles and say, I, D, I remember the times. Remember the, the size of the Sunday school? Remember when they used to go around and pick them up from there and everywhere? Remember the times when the churches would come together on a Saturday? Do you remember them prayer meetings we used to have? People would come from all over the place. Do you remember when we'd have a week of prayer? Do, do, do you remember when we would have Bible studies that were two and a half hours in length and nobody would bother? He, they were the good old days. Do you remember when we used to tithe every last penny into the church? He, them were the good old days. We, do you remember when, when the people of the church would actually build churches? Actually build churches? He, them were the days when we self-sacrificed. Boy, were they the days. And we, we can and we do. But Jesus didn't say remember your first works. Remember your first love. That's not what he, he said to stay at. He said, go and do them. And that's where, that's where we fall short. He gives the remedy. The remedy is, don't just talk about it. Remember, 
Faith without works is dead. You can have all the faith in the world. Faith without works is dead. You know, you can be one of the other Israelites that says, I've got faith to face Goliath. But when Goliath comes, you run in the opposite direction. There was one, his name was David, that took the faith that he had and ran at Goliath. Faith without works is dead. And Jesus is telling them here, don't just reminisce. You can reminisce all you like. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to get you any further on. He says, go and do what you used to do. That's the remedy. That's the solution. Do what you used to do. Verse 6, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans that I also hate. Now this is important. My pastor used to say, whenever you're talking to anybody, he says, I always give them the praise sandwich. He said, I, would, I always begin with a bit of praise. Then in the middle, I'll tell them the crucial thing. And then at the end, I'll finish with a bit of praise uh, about them. He called it the praise sandwich. Well, here you see Jesus. He begins by encouraging them. And then, of course, he tells them what the root problem is, which is a serious issue. And then he goes on to tell them um, that he also commends them for hating the deeds of the Nicol... Well, what was this? Very quickly. Nicolation means the suppression of the laity or lording it over the laity. There had come in and there was coming in a, a system within the church, um, Gnosticism. People that claim to be on a higher level, to have a higher revelation, a deeper knowledge and all these kind of things. And there began to become a separation between the laity, the people and these so-called, uh, this, this group. We've, we've all seen it. You know, seeing people sit on thrones, on um, the the, the uh, on the stage, sitting on thrones, actual thrones, or sitting on huge leather seats. Everybody else has got a hard seat, but they've got the, this huge leather seat. You have to ask them for permission to go on holiday. You have to ask them for permission to get married, or this thing and the other thing. They see themselves as completely different than you. Uh, this is the Nicolaitanism, the suppression of the laity. It is wrong, it is not, not biblical. We've had it in the past, it doesn't work. You can't force people to do things. It has to be something that they desire to do. It has to be. I think Paul talks about it actually in, um, in, in, in 2 Corinthians. I'll just read you a very quick verse here, 2 Corinthians 1, 24. Paul says, um, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, by, by faith you stand. Paul says, we don't have dominion over your faith. We don't. We, pastors don't have dominion over people's faith. And when you move into this realm where the pastor or the leader has that kind of control, it is Nicolaitanism, it is wrong, and it's to be rejected. And Jesus said, I'm glad that you hate this. He says, I hate it too. However, listen. God has given to the church, he has given to the church, pastors, elders, prophets, evangelists, teachers. He's given the church the fivefold ministry for the edification of the body, for the building up of the body. And it does say in Hebrews that you are to, um, you, you, you are to submit to authority because they give an account to you. So there's a balance in all these things. You know, people will say, I'm not coming under this Nicolaitanism thing. But there's structure in the Word of God. There are pastors, there are uh, 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 elders and apostles and teachers and things like this. And we are to be accountable. We are to be. So there is a balance. Now let's get to the last verse. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What a wonderful promise at the end here for the overcomer. What does it mean by the overcomer? We've just looked at what they did. We've looked at how commendable it was. We've looked at how this church began. Brilliant beginnings, wonderful church to be a part of. But they were to do what? They were to get back to their first love. Their first love is not just loving God. You only really know how much a person loves God by how much they love one another. Galatians tells us the fruit of the Spirit 
Galatians, well, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, first and foremost, love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. What does he say? What does he say? He says those that overcome are going to have access to what? To fruit. To fruit. That's what they're going to have access to. And I believe that's a promise both in their life now, but also in the life to come in the life to come, but even now. You see, the thing is, as we love one another, we get access to one another's fruit. We get access through to the tree of life. We begin to pick from one another's branches. We begin to experience the fruit of the Spirit together and the church becomes far sweeter, far more wonderful. We have access through. Remember Genesis? Freely you can eat from any of the trees in the garden. There's only one tree that you can't eat from. Jesus says the, the overcomer can eat from the tree of life. And all the, we have access. And suddenly that sweetness comes back into our lives. You, you're only conning yourself when you say, I love God, I don't need the people of God. You're only conning yourself. Jesus says there are two commands and the second is, is just like it love one another how can you love one another if you're never there i've mentioned this before imagine as somebody being a professional football player right the next cristiano ronaldo and the next lionel messi and they're told that um they have the potential of being one of the best football players ever but they practice on their own and they they they, they never want to practice with anybody else and you know, the coach comes and says, look, I know you're good, right? I know you're good. But if you practice on your own, you're never going to get any better. And they say, yeah, but, you know, nobody's on my level. So I practice on my own. And so the coach has to remind them that football is a team game and that you will never learn to be a brilliant footballer as long as you see yourself as an individual. Football's a team game. Church is team. Church is about a body. It is impossible to isolate yourself away from the body of Christ and still have love. And that is the crucial element that the Church of Ephesus had to get back to. Get back to doing what you used to do. And for some of you, it's regularly attending church. Whether that be a house group, whether that be a large church like Ephesus, or whether it be a small church. Regularly attending church. Being accountable to other people. Learning how to bear up with one another in love again. So that our love is no longer this pseudo-vertical love, but it's also a horizontal love. And we get back into our lives what it really means to be a Christian. To the overcomer, he says, I will grant that they can eat from the tree of life in the paradise of my God. Love is critical. Love is critical. That's why Paul, to the Corinthian church that had all those giftings, he made sure that they knew. There was no way that they could say when they get to be with God, oh, we didn't know that. Nah, Corinthians 13 nails it, doesn't it? Three things remain, faith, hope and love, and the greatest by far is love. The overcomer, the overcomer will get to eat from the tree of life. Finally then, we're going to be looking at these seven churches as seven different dispensations. So the seven churches have a wonderful surprise just below the surface. Not only are there seven literal churches which existed around AD 90, but there are seven types of churches which always have existed in Christendom at some point. 
There are also seven kinds of churches which will exist just prior to the, to the return of the Lord. But they also resemble in some way seven church ages that slightly overlap one another, but they resemble seven different church ages. Let me just say this in closing. The only time I think I've ever been disappointed by the Bible is when I was a, a young, very young Christian and I was reading through the New Testament. I'd read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, really enjoyed it, looked wonderful, particularly John. And I got into the book of Acts and I was thrilled <coughs> to find that Acts was a continuation from the Gospels. I thought that was brilliant. So now it was picking up from when Jesus was ascended, the Holy Spirit came down, Acts chapter 2, and the church began to go out and wonderful things happened and they went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, you've got, you've got Paul in Rome and that's where it ends, isn't it? And it ends very open-endedly. You just see Paul in Rome and I think the last word in, in Acts is unhindered. The gospel was allowed to permeate on, and it was unhindered. But you've got this kind of really strange ending and I have to say as a, as a newborn Christian, I was, um, I was perplexed to find that after the book of Acts, Romans was not about Paul's exploits in Rome. I saw that it was called Romans. I turned to the letter. As a new Christian, I thought it was going to be all about the church and what happened in Rome and all the adventures and stuff. I couldn't believe it when, I, when it was a letter. I was really disappointed. I wanted it to be a continuation of the book of Acts, but it wasn't. It was a letter. Turn to the next book, Corinthians. Another letter? Second Corinthians, another letter? I was genuinely disappointed. So I started to flick through the New Testament quite quickly at that point and realising that they were all letters. I was very disappointed at the time. Finally, I got to the book of Revelation. I started to read that. I thought, wow, this is, this is amazing. There's something about this book that is just incredible. Then I got to ch chapter 2. I thought, there's even more letters here. Letters, letters, letters. Well, it wasn't until an old, an old pastor by the name of Fred Howell has gone to be with the Lord now. Fred Howell introduced me to somebody who was, well, new to me at the time, and many of you know him, a man called Jacob Prash. And Jacob Prash had just done a teaching on the seven churches of Revelation. And Fred Owl said to me that he, he, you must hear this teaching, which I think was seven tapes long. It was a very big teaching. And Jacob Prash began to explain something that I'd never heard anybody explain before. Since then, of course, I've done lots of study on this. And it is, it is something that is um, widely thought of. But at the time, I'd never heard of it. And I'd never heard any teaching ever like the teaching that I'd heard on the seven churches that Jacob Prash did all those years ago. And suddenly I began to think about when I was a young Christian and, and my disappointment when the book of Acts ended so open-endedly. I thought, what a funny finish. It just doesn't feel right to me how the Bible would just leave something to finish like that. Paul's in Rome, that's it, it ends. Then you've got all these letters. When I realised that the seven churches correspond to seven different church ages, and trust me, as we go in this, you will see that they do. You'll see the evidence that they do. Then you realise that the book of Acts was not the end, but the book of Acts only handed over the baton to the church of Ephesus, which represents the apostolic age, the age of the apostles. And at the end of the Age of the Apostles, there was a cooling down of love. Exactly what Jesus said. And the church of Ephesus, the actual name Ephesus means not lasting. 
So then the church age of Ephesus hands the baton over to the next church age, which is Smyrna. Smyrna means to be anointed for burial. And it corresponds to that church age of Christians that were literally martyred for their cause over a 200 year period of time leading up to the time of Constantine. So the church age of Smyrna hands over the baton to the church age of Pergamon. And Pergamon means divorced. And it, was, it covers the period of time, and you'll see this as we look into it. It's amazing how it corresponds to the church age where Constantine began to um, marry the state, and the state and the church began to marry together, and there, there became a divorce away from the pure roots of Christianity to this pseudo uh, horrible mix that we see in the time of Pergamon. Then the church age of Pergamon hands over the baton to the church age of Thyatira. The word Thyatira means continuing sacrifice. It was at this time that the, that the popes of the church demanded that, the, that Jesus himself would be re-crucified again and again and again through the mass. And that's exactly what Thyatira means, continuing sacrifice. Then the church of Thyatira would hand over the baton to the church of Sardis, the church age of Sardis, which represents the Reformation period. And of course, the Reformation period had many good things, but it was incomplete, and the term Sardis means incomplete. Then the church age of Sardis hand over the baton to the church age of Philadelphia, and Philadelphia means brotherly love, brotherly love. And it was the church age of the great evangelistic push of the missionaries, particularly actually from Great Britain, going out into all the world. And finally, the church age of Philadelphia hands over that baton. And you know how it is in a relay race where you have one running at the same time as the other and they ha it's a crucial point that they hand over that baton so that the, the last runner can really run? That's you and that's me. We are the final church age. The baton has been handed over to us and it is down to us as to whether we run this race with everything that we have. And that is what we're going to be looking at as we go through this wonderful teaching that the Lord gave us. Let me just say in conclusion, what's the most important part of the Bible? I believe it's the part that you're studying at the time that you're studying it. And right now, I'm going to be looking at the seven churches. And I believe that we'll see the reason why these really are the final words of Jesus to the church before the Harpazio, before the rapture. God bless you. See you next time.